Should these women look like child molesters? The DA's office said they were, then it said they weren't. What we had here were the social workers in questioning the children, asking very leading and very suggestive questions of the children. They'd have little Bobby sitting there, and they'd say to Bobby, uh, did the bad teacher uh, touch you in a yucky way in this place right here? And Bobby would say no, and they would uh, push a few times, and Bobby would continue to say no. Then they'd say, but wait a minute, Johnny has already told us that this happened. Now, you're just as smart as Johnny, aren't you? And after a little bit of this, then maybe Bobby would say, okay, he'd nod his head. Yeah, it happened that way. What you're charging is that the former district attorney, Philip Ozian, simply did a miserable job. What he did is he charged people without any investigation whatsoever. A routine roust of civilians by Israeli troops in occupied Lebanon. This is a movie made not by Israel's enemies, but by the Israeli army itself. Not a very pretty picture of Israeli soldiers. Did it concern you that this film showed Israeli soldiers um, acting as, uh, as less than perfect, breaking under the strain, killing an innocent? Did it concern you that it might hurt the army? Uh, no, I don't think so. We never claim that we are supermen. Never. I'm Mike Wallace. I'm Morley Safer. I'm Harry Reasoner. I'm Ed Bradley. I'm Diane Sawyer. Those stories and Andy Rooney, tonight on 60 Minutes. The McMartin Preschool is the story of what was the biggest child molestation case in history. Over 300 counts of sodomy, rape, and oral copulation brought against three generations of the McMartin family and three teachers at their preschool in an upper middle class suburb of Los Angeles called Manhattan Beach. As we reported when we broadcast this story last fall, the allegations went beyond sexual molestation. They were tales of satanic rites, of pornographic pictures, of the mutilation of animals to frighten the children into silence. But from the beginning, the defendants in the case, the teachers, have insisted that they were the victims of a latter-day witch hunt. The United States has a rottenest judicial system in the whole world. Don't let anybody talk to me about Russia or South Africa or anything. We have it right here. You are guilty, and God help you if you try to prove you're innocent. That's the way we've been treated since the first day. The Virginia Manhattan McMartin is founder and owner of the now defunct McMartin Preschool. For three years, she, her family, and her colleagues have had to live with devastating publicity and personal disgrace. The prosecution brought more than 300 counts of molestation and conspiracy against the seven defendants. People versus Raymond Bucky, Peggy McMartin Bucky. This was their arraignment in a Los Angeles courtroom back in March of 1984. Raymond Bucky was refused bail. He is still in jail awaiting trial. His mother, Peggy McMartin Bucky, was held without bail for two years. She also faces trial. Babette Spittler, a teacher, was held in jail for two and a half months and then released on $400,000 bail. Betty Rader, a teacher, held for three months till she was released on $750,000. Peggy Ann Bucky, Virginia McMartin's granddaughter, was held for two and a half months until she was released on $100,000. Mary Ann Jackson, a teacher, released on $100,000. And Virginia McMartin was arrested and released on $50,000 bail. Two years ago, the defendants were described by the prosecution as so dangerous to the community that they should be kept in jail with no bail while awaiting trial. But early this year, when a new district attorney looked at the evidence, he said it was incredibly weak as to five of the women, and he dropped all charges against those five. Five women who are now trying to put their lives back together. What happened to your individual lives because of these charges? My character, my, my reputation has been destroyed. Ms. Jackson? Uh, we lost everything, almost everything that we had accumulated in 38 years of our married life. Ms. Bittler? Where do I start? During the time I was in jail, the custody of my children were taken away from me. During my jail, jail time, I called them on the phone when, what, times I could because 
That where, privilege was not given to me very often. Where were they? With my brother. Um, they were taken from the school that we had placed him in and arrested. At the time, my son was eight. He was, here I go again. He was told he was under arrest. Under arrest for what? He doesn't know for what. I don't know for what. I don't know why they took him into custody. I was behind bars if I was such a threat to him. Peggy? I, along with everyone else, lost every material possession that I had. I saw my family lose their home, their school, their bank account, everything. Everything went to attorneys, every last penny. I lost my career. I went six years to college to teach special ed, and the state has revoked my teaching credentials. And some of the children that have accused her weren't, she wasn't even in the school. Well, how long were you at the school, that is the McMartin preschool? I was there five weeks in 1978 as a substitute teacher, and that's all I was there. And you, Miss Spindler? Four years. Four years. And you were charged basically with doing what? Oral copulation on children and having children do it to me. That's enough. What was I charged with? Mm -hmm. The same as, as she just mentioned. Now, what is that all about? Why would the child say it if it weren't so? Mike, I do not know. How do you defend yourself against a child? How did this case get started? Where did those charges come from? The first complaint was made on behalf of a two-and-a-half-year-old boy by his mother in August of 1983. She called the Manhattan Beach Police, and she accused a young teacher at the McMartin Preschool, Ray Bucky, Virginia McMartin's grandson, of molesting her son. Later, that same mother told authorities that her little boy had also been molested by others and that he had been attacked by wild animals. She was later diagnosed as having mental problems. But at the time, the Manhattan Beach Police had no reason to doubt the woman, so they arrested Ray Bucky and then released him for lack of evidence. But they did not stop there. They sent this letter to 200 families whose children attended the school. In it, they named the Met Martin School, and Ray Bucky in particular, as a suspect in child molestation. And they asked the parents to interrogate their own children about oral sex, fondling of genitals, buttocks, or chest area, and sodomy. And they state that photos may have been taken of children without their clothing. The letter understandably panicked a lot of parents who besieged the district attorney's office. The DA sent the parents and their youngsters here to Children's Institute International, CII, where almost 400 children were eventually interviewed. Those interviews were used to prepare the indictments of the five women, as well as Ray Bucky and his mother Peggy Bucky. What you are watching is a demonstration of the CII interview technique using puppets and dolls. The actual videotaped interviews in this case have been sealed by court order. CII reported that a full 85%, 350 of the 400 children interviewed showed signs of molestation. But as we said two years later, a review of those videotaped interviews led the current Los Angeles District Attorney Ira Reiner to drop all charges against five of the defendants. He dropped all charges against those five, despite the fact that after an 18-month preliminary hearing, a judge had ordered all seven defendants to stand trial. Uh, and what did Ira Reiner see on those videotapes? But what we had here were the social workers in questioning the children, asking very leading and very suggestive questions of the children. They'd have little Bobby sitting there, and they'd say to Bobby, uh, did the bad teacher uh, touch you in a yucky way in this place right here? And Bobby would say no, and they would uh, push a few times, and Bobby would continue to say no. Then they'd say, but wait a minute, Johnny has already told us that this happened. Now, you're just as smart as Johnny, aren't you? And after a little bit of this, then maybe Bobby would say, okay, he'd nod his head, yeah, it happened that way. Now, Bobby hasn't supplied any details. He has been balled out, if you will, or chastised, because he isn't as smart as someone uh, who allegedly has already told them about this. He has been rewarded uh, with praise uh, when he says, yes, it did happen. What you have here is a situation then where uh, hundreds of children have been questioned, and then this material is turned over to the district attorney's office. The district attorney then, at that time, without any investigation whatsoever, none at all, 
turns it over to the grand jury for indictment purposes. Not surprisingly, the grand jury indicted. Now, with that as a background, is it any surprise that you have the kind of case that developed? It certainly isn't. What you're charging is that the former district attorney, Philip Ozian, simply did a miserable job. What he did is he charged people without any investigation whatsoever. This case was submitted to the grand jury without any investigation. The grand jury returned indictments, and that started the ball rolling. You're charging Philip Ozian with an unprofessional job. Well, that hardly begins to describe it. I think it's sad that he is expending his time and his energy attacking me when he should be expending his time and his energy supporting the children in that case and supporting the parents of those children who have been through untold agonies from the very beginning. Robert Philibosian was Ira Reiner's predecessor as district attorney of Los Angeles. So you feel no sympathy or deep concern for these five defendants? These five defendants are not the subject of sympathy or deep concern. The subject of sympathy and deep concern are the children who are molested. And if the children's allegations are not right? A grand jury said they were right. A preliminary hearing judge said they were right. After hearing them testify day in and day out, week in and week out, month in and month out for 18 months, a judge said that they were right. And Mr. Philibosian went on to say... So when Mr. Reiner says that there wasn't sufficient evidence or there wasn't sufficient corroboration, he is disagreeing with the grand jury, he is disagreeing with the judge, and he, in fact, is disagreeing with his own deputy in the case. Philibosian brought CII into the case, and he's persuaded their contribution was vital. They provided the ability for the prosecutors and for the investigators to learn from the children what had happened. It is incredibly difficult for a child to describe sexual assault, sexual molestation. In fact, it is difficult for an adult to describe such a situation. What those children did describe was not only molestation, but naked games engaged in by all seven of the defendants, porno picture sessions, and animal mutilations designed to frighten them into silence. They also told of satanic rituals and sexual abuse, to which they were subjected after being flown during school hours to another city. Mary Emmons is executive director of CII, Children's Institute International. I believe that the children described in the words and the ways that they knew how what they had experienced. One of the children or several of the children said that they went to an airport and took a trip and and had some kind of an experience, awful experience, and came flew back and went back to school and all of this was between nine and twelve of a given day. Well, Mike, it is well documented in the literature that the children of this age do not have any sense of time or you know, the kind of sense that we as adults have. But they know if they're flying. I agree. I think they would know if they're flying. And? Were any horses dug up? Were any animals slaughtered? Did any satanic rites take place? Did any pictures of pornography show up any place? Any of the above. Not one or two. Any. I think you're, you're correct. I, I know of none. Why do you believe these children, Ms. Simmons? I think the children's way of telling what they had to tell uh, was based on uh, very convincing uh, information, and there's very convincing medical um, evidence that backs up what the children are saying. But as far as your procedures were concerned, as far as the information that you've gotten on these videotapes, you have no doubt that it's good, accurate information and will stand up in court and should stand up in court. Mike, the uh, procedures that we used were designed to provide treatment to the children that came here. They were not designed for a court of law. All right. But material from those interviews did get into a court of law. They became a major part of the criminal case as some of the children on the tapes came to court to testify. Meanwhile, the prosecution tried to corroborate the children's stories of animal mutilation, underground tunnels, Satanism, and child pornography, and they failed. Despite a worldwide search aided by the FBI, nothing was found. They even dug up the, uh, all around the school looking for underground tunnels, and we have a devil that lives under the avocado tree. 
Now, if you uh, to drive me down there, I'll see if I can get him to come out and meet you. And then the medical evidence of scarring due to molestation reported by CII's doctors came under attack when it turned out that none of the 350 alleged victims, their parents or their pediatricians, had ever complained about that in the past before the case broke. Can you believe that every child that ever went to that school for the last 25 years was molested and not a single parent ever yeah. recognized it? Beyond that, the five women say that the school was too small, too intimate for anyone to molest children there and allegedly play naked games indoors and out without everyone knowing. It's yeah. impossible. Why? The school is very small. Four classrooms, all connected. Big windows. Big windows in all the classrooms. Windows even on the doors. Sits on the busiest street in Manhattan Beach. Traffic but going by it all the time. And there is no way that anything could go on in that school without everyone knowing what's going on within the school. Assistant District Attorney Lael Rubin has been lead prosecutor in the McMartin case under both District Attorney Philibosian and his successor, Ira Reiner. Were hundreds of children molested at the McMartin School, sexually molested? Very large numbers of children were molested at, at school. I mean, I, I don't see that at this, uh, at this point, whether one says it were 50 or 100 or 200 or 300, that really is beside the point at this point in time. Because what is the issue is that children were molested at this school. But whether there be two or whether there be a hundred. Oh, wait a minute. If there were two, then it wouldn't have gotten the attention that it got. And you were the lead attorney pushing this, not just inside the preliminary hearing, but outside in the halls, too, and talking to the press. Well, what, what I talked to the press about outside in the hall was, um, for, the, for the most part, about evidence, testimony that had already been presented inside the courtroom. Deputy D.A. Leo Rubin told UPI many of the children said they were taken from the school to other locations where still and motion pictures were made and the youngsters, quote, were offered up to strangers for whatever purposes, close quote. You believed that when you said it and believe it now? Yeah, absolutely. You told the press, Ms. Rubin, that the discovery of rabbit ears, a cape, and a candle were corroboration of the satanic aspect of this case. Right? I was quoted as saying that. That's correct. Still believe that? That... There are satanic aspects to this case? We did have testimony at the preliminary hearing um, about some activities that I suppose one would refer to as satanic. We asked Reuben why none of the children, their parents or pediatricians, had ever complained about molestation before the case broke. Do you really think that there are doctors out there who two, three, five years ago, um, pediatricians who really were trained to examine young children um, in their genital areas, many of the doctors um, suggested other alternatives or other reasons for pain, discomfort, urinary infections, vaginitis, all sorts of other problems. Is it, po because is be it possible, Ms. Rubin, that they are better trained to understand than are you? Well, they're medical doctors and I'm not, but what I'm saying is that um, not only they, but, but parents and a lot of other people in this case, we're not willing to believe and accept that in fact children were being, were being molested. Our children were pioneers. I mean, they, they forged a whole new interest in an area that none of us ever wanted to believe existed, and that's child molestation. We Tim Wheeler is the father of two children allegedly molested. He arranged for us to talk to a group of McMartin parents. We all thought of a perpetrator as some dirty old man in a trench coat that exposed himself and ran, and they certainly didn't live in your area. They hung out in Central Park or some, some place where you don't go. Why did no pediatrician ever have a report made by even one parent along the way about this kind of thing prior to this business coming up. But that isn't correct, sir. It isn't. Many, many of us took our children to our pediatricians and said, we're having problems. There's bleeding with bowel movements. There's vaginitis. And they said, stop the bubble bath. Okay, we did that. Or have more bran in their cereal. Fine, we did that. And it continued. 
So they, we saw these things, our pediatricians saw them, and they had no knowledge to link it because we, came, we were from wonderful home, lovely homes in a nice community. We were only taking them to preschools. If the specifics of what the child has said will not stand up under scrutiny, then it is sensible to wonder if, if indeed the molestation of all of these people in all of these events took place. Well, there, there's, there's one, one issue that's avoided, and that is the overall evidence. You can't look at one specific instance and say, we're going to analyze it by whether or not a plane ride occurred. If a plane ride happened, there was molestation that occurred. Okay, what they always come back to is that I was molested, I was touched, I was forced into oral copulation, uh, objects were stuck up my anus, whatever the case may be. It always comes back to that. This was a case that involved the molestation of some children. It was blown massively out of proportion to become the case of the century. It is nothing of the sort. It is simply a case of ch some children, a few children, over a period of years being molested. Obviously, you don't think the charges against the five women should have been dropped. Absolutely not. You are with and it is this man, Raymond Bucky, and his mother, who are still facing scores of charges of sodomy and rape of children under 14. Raymond Bucky has been held without bail in Los Angeles County Jail for the last two and a half years. Why are you talking to us now? You've never spoken to a reporter before, my understanding. No. Why are you talking now? I think it's time. Why I think the time, I think the tide is turning where people are stepping back out of the hysteria that grew out of this and looking at us, wait a minute, there's too much here that can be disproved and we want to see that person. People want to see, look at me, but I think everybody believes that they can look into someone's eyes and uh, if I is the monster that I've been claimed, that I've been uh, made out to be, everybody would have known it. You never, repeat, never had anything of a sexual nature take place between you, Ray, and any of these children. Never. Let me read you what the kids say. A couple. Of, you've, you've seen all of this stuff. Did Ray put his penis inside your mouth? Yes. And did he put it inside your butt? Yes. Did it hurt? Yes. I think some of the children, children have actually come to believe it happened. They've been told so many times, they've been reinforced by what they were led to say from the very beginning. If they can get up on the stand and say, yeah, Ray did that to me. Well, how did he do it? What position are you in? I don't remember. They can't give you any specifics because it never happened. To be led to say something at that young of age and to believe the adults that are around you that are reinforcing you to say it, you're going to believe it after a while. They've dropped the charges against five of the defendants. It's only you and your mother who are involved now. Yeah. Why? You know, you've got to have a scapegoat. You kept two people in jail for two years. You're going to back off now and say, oh, sorry, they're innocent, too? It's an amazing fact how you can have the same evidence and the same children testing fine against all seven, but you can say there's weak evidence against five of them. No, the evidence is not the same. Uh, not all of the evidence was compromised by CII and their process and their techniques of asking leading and suggestive questions. As you go through the tapes very carefully, you will find some of the uh, statements made by the children have a great deal of specificity and detail to them. Many of the statements are very spontaneous. And not in every case did they put words into the children's mouth. There are two people of those seven. Ray that, Bucky and his mother. And his mother. That we are convinced upon carefully looking at the evidence that indeed they did molest these children. We know what's going to happen if you're found guilty by a jury. Yes. You're going to go to prison for a long, long time, obviously. If I survive in there. What do you mean? They've marked me. They've marked me if I'm free or if I'm put in prison. If you're in prison, you're afraid that something could happen to you at the hands of the prison population. I'm not afraid. I'm aware of the reality of prison. And if you go free? They've ruined my life. I've watched them ruin my family. I've watched them ruin my mother and grandmother's lives. I've watched him ruin my sister's career. I was just starting at that school. I didn't, I hadn't made up my mind of what I wanted to do in life. But they bring a scarlet letter on me that I can never get rid of. I don't know what kind of life I would have. I can't trust people anymore because I've seen too much of the politics, the corruption, the evil, the anger, the ignorance. Nonetheless, Ray Bucky and his mother, Peggy McMartin Bucky, go on trial this month in Los Angeles.
The five women are free of all charges, but not of all taint. We all would like our names cleared. And that, to me, is almost second to... I think people have to know what happened here. I think mm -hmm. people ha in the world need to know this was a witch hunt, that nothing happened at the school, and it could happen to anyone. Because it can, and it has been. It's happening all over the country. Because of this case, it has happened everywhere. And if people realize nursery schools aren't places where children are being molested and raped and sodomized, it doesn't happen. It didn't happen in ours. I believe in this case. And I believe that horrible crimes occurred at the McMartin Preschool. And that, that's what I intend to argue to a jury. After years of pretrial hearings and motions, the trial of Raymond Bucky and his mother, Peggy McMartin Bucky, is finally underway in Los Angeles. The lawyers agree it will last at least a year. The success of the movie Platoon this year might mean that Americans are willing, even anxious, to face up to Vietnam. The movie is one way for those who fought the war to explain some of it to those who did not. There have been other such cathartic war movies. Last fall, we looked at one. The subject was Israel's Vietnam, its disastrous invasion of Lebanon, in which the casualties included not only human lives, but some beliefs the Israelis held about themselves, particularly about the young men it sends to war. The movie, called Ricochets in English, features real Israeli soldiers playing themselves and real Lebanese Arabs playing themselves. What makes it special is the movie was made by the Israeli army itself. A routine roust of civilians by Israeli troops in occupied Lebanon. An Israeli soldier cracking up, blasting away at an enemy that isn't there. <laughs> A platoon waiting in ambush, waiting and waiting and waiting. killing an innocent boy they'd befriended. film with these Israeli soldiers, many of whom served in Lebanon and may have to again. For them, the movie may explain what they can't explain, about a war they really couldn't win. If you want to show the world what you think about what you did or what, or about what happened in uh, Lebanon, you have to do a movie like that. The war in Lebanon was not a popular war, sort of Israel's Vietnam. The main purpose of the movie was to let everybody in this country, now that's letting out being shown in the world, is to let everybody know exactly what happened there. War is what each individual feels or perceives. To a soldier, war is usually what's happening in a radius of only a few feet around him. Fear, confusion, and that constant terrifying question, what the hell am I doing here? In battle, there's little time to think of the big picture. What the army made in ricochets is a little picture that allows a whole society to get a glimpse of the ugly business it sends its sons out to do. 
In a highly unusual move, the Israel Defense Force, the IDF, has released its film to the public, and it's been playing to sold-out audiences in Israel for more than three months. The director, Eli Cohen, admits that what he ended up with went well beyond what the army originally had in mind. When it was decided to make this film, it was just another tool for officers' courses uh, to deal with problems, and there were problems, let's not, not deny it, in Lebanon. But then it was just a small decision about a small project. No one uh, expected it to be such a film. Cohen convinced the army to allow him to produce a feature film rather than a documentary and to use Israeli soldiers and Lebanese Arabs in the occupied village of El Khayyam. They didn't have to go through method acting because it was there. The film centers around three main characters. Gadi, the idealistic young officer being sent to Lebanon. And Tuvia, a battle-hardened commander who has lost some of his men and with them a piece of his humanity. When Gadi allows a car carrying a sick woman to pass a checkpoint, he comes face to face with Tuvia's view of Lebanon. and then there's georgie the grunt the platoon cynic who sees lebanon as a crazy house peopled by madmen and fools including himself הנוצרים שונאים את הדרוזים ואת השיעים ואת הסונים ואת הפלסטינאים. הדרוזים שונאים את הנוצרים... לא, הד... כן, הדרוזים שונאים את הנוצרים ואת השיעים ואת הסורים. השיעים דפקו אותם כל השנים, אז הם שונאים את כולם. הסונים שונאים את מי שהרייס שלהם אמר להם לשנוא, והפלסטינאים שונאים אחד את השני, חוץ מזה שהם שונאים את האחרים. עכשיו, לכולם יש מכנה אחד. כולם, מה זה שונאים? שונאים אותנו את הישראלים. הם היו רוצים לפוצץ לנו את הצורה אם היו יכולים, אבל הם לא, בגלל צה"ל. Director Cohen screened his film for the Army Brass and for the Chief of Staff himself, who was expecting a simple training film. After the light went on, there was a long silence, and everybody is like usually the case in the Army. Everybody waits for the Chief of Staff to start, and he didn't. And there was a very long silence. I didn't know how to interpret it. And then he said very slowly, even slowly than I am speaking now, uh, well, for the army, yes. For the outside public, for... I have to sleep on it. I have to think it over. I said I have to sleep on it because you know that the Lebanese uh, war was very disputed, disputed between uh, us here in uh, Israel, and I had to consider whether it's not going to be, you know, looked at as intervention in the internal political life. General Moshe Levy, chief of the Israel Defense Force. Did it concern you that this film showed Israeli soldiers um, acting as, uh, as less than perfect, breaking under the strain, killing an innocent. Uh, no, I don't think so. We never claim that we are supermen. Never. To pull the trigger or not to pull the trigger, this is the main uh, dilemma. But this has never been a dilemma, really and truly before, in any of the many wars 
that Israel's fought since 1948. Well, this was a different one. This was a different one. This war uh, was uh, unlike, uh, let's take for instance, the uh, Six Days War. Yes, if you are in Sinai and there is a sand hill and there is some movement beyond this sand hill, there is no question who is there. It's the enemy. You have to shoot. If you are in a village in Le Lebanon and there is some movement uh, beyond the bushes, who's there? Enemy? Child? Woman, child? This, is, this was a different war. A different war indeed. These scenes of the Israeli bombardment of Beirut are not part of the film. The bombing is not alluded to. No mention of Ariel Sharon and his chief of staff, Raful Aitan, who critics bitterly condemn for deceiving the cabinet and the army about the scope and the length of the war. No mention of an Israeli commission's charge that Sharon was indirectly responsible for the massacre of Palestinians by Christian militiamen in the Sabra and Shatila refugee camps. In fact, no mention of Sharon. What if there had been? It wouldn't uh, see the light. <laughs> we try to avoid uh, these problems because, and we find a corner where we can tell a story without uh, getting into all these things. Had uh, Sharon would be mentioned in this film. Could the film have gone further and raised some of the bigger dilemmas that were going through this country at the time? Uh, over the uh, question of certain deceptions by Defense Minister Sharon in terms of how long the army was going to be there, how far it was going to go, over issues like like uh, the the uh, uh, the bombing of Beirut, over the the Shatila incidents, had had those been included, would you have said release the film? First of all, I don't want to agree with what you said in your question. Well, let me ask about a question. Let, let, people. let me ask a question. It's not my mandate to say about let me ask, uh, let me ask the question. anything. Let me ask the question in a different way. Had the film included some of the larger issues of the military staying as long as it stayed in Lebanon um, over the Saba and Shatila incidents, had it made reference to those, would you have said yes to this film? I think it would have been another film, and it was not the mandate of the military installation, the military service, to bring a film it, uh, to, to show up problems that are in internal political dispute. The climactic scene in Ricochets is intended to be a microcosm of Israel's experience in Lebanon. Gadi's platoon has tracked a terrorist to a house occupied by civilians. Gadi is ordered to blast the place even though innocent people are inside. <laughs> This man faced a similar dilemma on a much larger scale. Eli Geba, who at 32 was the youngest brigade commander in the Israeli army. Considered a brilliant leader, his troops spearheaded the invasion and battled up the coast road to the outskirts of Beirut. But when Geva was ordered to invade the city, he refused, offering instead to act as a medic or as a common soldier. He was dismissed from the IDF. This is the first war which the IDF didn't win. Few people can say that we didn't lose. I don't think that maybe only General Sharon or Rafour are saying that we won, but no one else will tell you that we won. I was sure that the price we are going to pay concerning moral problems uh, to ourselves and to the population are prices that 
we shouldn't pay or we shouldn't do. Did you regard the orders, your orders then as illegal or immoral? I think that decisions at the top concerning the group of uh, Shamir, uh, Begin, uh, Sharon, and uh, Mr. Eitan were both illegal and immoral. In most Western armies, the tradition is that an officer should not follow an illegal order. Many orders in this war weren't carried out. You mean there were other alligators who didn't choose to speak up, but not to, to uh, do the orders as they were given or as they were meant to be given. Do you think the men lost in Lebanon were just a waste of lives? My opinion, not, I do not think, I, I, I'm sure. Is that another reason for making the film, or an important reason for releasing this film? You know, always when you are fighting with an enemy, you over-sophisticate, you, you think that he is over-sophisticated. Uh, don't over-estimate uh, those who thought about the film. It was a happy accident, is what you're saying. Yes, I, I was more polite. <laughs> Gotti chooses to disobey his orders and goes in by himself. Question. So what do you do? You don't have a lot of time to think about it. The problem is you're fighting in the houses of people, in the streets of where people lived. You can't just chase everyone out of the country, say all the terrorists stay, we fight them. When we finish, everyone can, can come back. I keep hearing the term from a lot of people that many Israelis have become Lebanized. What does that mean? Well, that many of the soldiers who served there have become Lebanized. You mean they hide their feelings? You mean they... No, become harder, become more cruel, become uh, well, less, less humane. Of course, they become numb. I of course, think, soldiers, right? soldiers who went through this war, or through this, this time of three, three years that uh, we were in Lebanon, you can't just go in there, go out, and stay indifferent. Everybody who sees you hates you, and you know it. And all of a sudden, come out and forget that. You know they hate you, and at least it's smart. You hate them, you don't trust them anymore. If you ever trusted somebody, I mean, Arabs or people with strangers, you stop trusting, you don't turn your backs off. I think that uh, eventually, every soldier feel that way. Like, everyone in the, in the damn country is pointing a gun at me. Not at the commander, not at the brigade, but at me. What? I mean, what? It's been more than four years since the invasion of Lebanon, and the Israelis are still there, still in the soup, in what they call a security zone, along with the UN forces, and the Syrians, and the Shiites, and the Druze, and the Christians, and still the PLO. Maybe Georgie had it right all along. Sir, sir, ou l'orak, l'emrak, sir, ou gam ken le chat chouka. Sixty minutes. A CBS News weekly magazine will continue. Time once again for a few minutes with Andy Rooney. If the only impression you had about how American women dress came from looking at commercials or newspaper and magazine ads, you'd have a wrong idea of what they look like day in and day out. You'll never see it in an advertisement, but this is what half the women in New York are wearing to work these days. 
They're wearing sneakers. They don't call them sneakers, but they're wearing sneakers. Some men are wearing them too, but they're outnumbered. There's been a revolution in the sneaker business. I went to the showroom of a company that makes a lot of them. How many different kinds of sneakers do you have? We uh, uh, about 180 different models of shoes. We don't make sneakers. We're in the shoe business. These aren't sneaks? These are not sneaks. Oh. These are athletic footwear that's built on a last, and it is, it is a shoe. It's it not sound more expensive, is that? That's right. <laughs> it is more expensive, but it's also a much better product. 180 different kinds. I mean, when I was a kid, you, you had your pair of sticks, and you played football in the fall, and baseball, but you wore the same kind of sneaks. Well, today, everyone is a specialist. Yeah. Boy, you could fill a closet, couldn't you, if you, you played could. a lot of sports? You could. It could. What are these? Let's say, lightweight ladies' training shoe. I got, um, I got a lady I'd like to train. Do you think you have a... Fire. Great shoe for aerobic dancing. What are some of these? Now, this is our Grand Prix. This is our tennis shoe, the one in navy blue. And what's that's, this? And that's our top basketball shoe. Now, you could have fooled me. Uh, I mean, what's the difference? One basketball and, and one's... Well, if you'll notice, we have stitching tennis. around the sole of this shoe, which keeps it which together better. Assistant? That's the basketball shoe. Yeah. You wouldn't want to play tennis yeah. in a stitched shoe. Uh, well, you can play tennis in a stitched shoe, but you can't play basketball in a shoe that yeah, isn't right. stitched. If I you expect to shoot them. That's been the trouble with my tennis. I have to look and see what... And what about these? Now, that, that's a sneak. You can't tell me. That isn't well, a sneak. Well, but it's a lasted shoe. Be. It's an inexpensive ladies' tennis shoe with a two-zone sole made for comfort and wear. Mm -hmm. uh, it you is sound lasted. like a shoe salesman, well, I tell you. <laughs> I've sold a few in my day. <laughs> and what are these? Are, who, who buys the high ones? All my sneaks used to be high. Top basketball players today are practically all wearing high shoes. How much your shoe like that cost? Just roughly. Sixty-nine ninety-five. Sixty-nine dollars for a sneak. Wow, that's a lot of, lot of money. There's a, there's a that's a high top shoe. training shoe for winter running in snow and in ice. Uh, snow tires. Snow tire effect, mm -hmm. right? And so, yeah. Mm -hmm. and what, what, this is a funny. Well, that's thing. a training shoe. Great shoe for someone that's hurt. <laughs> to learn how to run. Well, really, there you are a lot of run runners right? that are hurt, yeah. and this shoe is a great relief to, yeah. to the leg injury. I hurt a lot when I run. I yeah. think that's my shoe. Here's one. Shoes. Now, what, what in the world is this? That's uh, an official shoe for a basketball mm -hmm. official. Yeah, and this is a... Uh, that's a coaching shoe uh, for coach, coaches. Coach has their own shoe, huh? Yeah. These are my tennis sneaks. They never look the way they do in the showroom, do they? I beat Cronkite in these once. I'm having them bronzed. I'm Diane Sawyer. We'll be back next week with another edition of 60 Minutes. For a printed transcript of this or any edition of 60 Minutes, send $3 to 60 Minutes Transcripts, 2 John Street, New York, New York, 10038.